Good evening, and welcome to tonight's installment of Jesus Christ and the Dividing Wall, Race and God's Mission. I'm Hunter Farrell with the World Mission Initiative here at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And I'm Casey Howard, a member of the conference planning team and a current Master of Divinity student at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. On behalf of the seminary's continuing education program and the World Mission Initiative, we are pleased to welcome you to the first installment of this month of conversations and workshops. We want to say a word of thanks to the 55 churches, presbyteries, denominations, and individuals who are sponsoring the series and whose names you see on the screen now. Without them, we couldn't have organized a conference on this scale. Our major sponsors include the Presbyterian Mission Agency's Racial Equity and Women's Intercultural Ministries, the Presbyterian Foundation, the Synod of the Trinity, and Shadyside and Unity Presbyterian Churches, both of Pittsburgh. Special thanks goes to the generous contributors to the W. Don McClure Endowed Lecture in World Mission and Evangelism, which sponsors this lecture each year, and to the McClure family. The, Don, the Reverend Don and Lida McClure served as missionaries in Sudan and Ethiopia for nearly 50 years. Finally, we want to give a shout out to our conference planning team that did a remarkable work over the past two years to make this series possible, as well as our staff colleagues at Pittsburgh Seminary who supported us in so many ways. Friends, this month's series of four conversations, including tonight's event, addresses the urgent and difficult, the difficult topic of systemic racism and how it impacts our participation in God's mission. There'll be parts of tonight's conversation that will stretch each one of us and push us to reconsider old assumptions. So tonight, we ask you to be present and to persevere even when things said might seem new or strange or even painful. Our hope is that these conversations and our participation in them will embody the Zulu language term made famous by the Anglican Church of South Africa, Indaba, which means that even when we disagree strongly on an issue, we stay at the table because we're still part of one family together, the family of Jesus Christ. So before we begin, let me remind you how this evening will work. In just a moment, we'll welcome Reverend Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. He'll speak for about 40 minutes, after which we'll have the opportunity for him to answer some of your questions while we're still gathered on this national Zoom webinar. We invite you to send your questions for our speaker using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can send us your questions anytime during the presentation. Then Hunter and I will pose the questions and at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, our national conversation will end and you can proceed to your local group discussions using the link that your local convener sent you. The evening will conclude in your small group and we suggest you close in prayer. Because so many people registered for this month's series, we had to close registration last week but we are making each session's recording available on our website 48 hours after each session ends. We'll give you that link at the end of our time together tonight. And now without further delay, it's our privilege to introduce our presenter for this evening, the Reverend Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. Jonathan's an evangelical Christian from North Carolina who serves as associate minister at St. John's Missionary Baptist Church. He's also the co-founder of Rutba House and currently the director of the School for Conversion, a popular education center that works to make surprising friendships possible. His latest book is Reconstructing the Gospel, Finding Freedom from Slaveholder Religion. Welcome, Reverend Jonathan. Well, thank you so much. It's a uh, delight to be here with you and uh, like many of you, I'm learning to negotiate the technology. So, uh, so I'm so grateful to everyone on the team there at Princeton Theological Seminary for uh, uh, making all of the necessary adjustments so that we could still be together. Uh, and in some ways, uh, 
despite the challenges of this season, this format is allowing more of us to be together and for a longer time than we would have if we had been there on the campus at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. But uh, let, let me just uh, uh, say all of my thank yous. I, I can't uh, think of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary without uh, thinking of my uh, mentor and friend, Eugene Peterson, who spent time there. And I'm always grateful for the way that community facilitated his uh, sharing of the message with all of us. So I'm grateful for that. I am uh, who I am because people loved me. <laughs> and I've been loved well all my life. Uh, but I was loved first by Baptists in North Carolina who taught me to love the Bible. And so I uh, wanted to begin this conversation by turning to the text. If you would allow a Baptist preacher to just take up the text for a few minutes, um, the text that's offering the theme for this conversation. And let me just say uh, one more thing that I'm delighted about is that I get to have this conversation with my dear sister, Brenda Salter McNeil. This is going all month. I'm just here on the first night uh, um, to prepare the way, as it were, to use a biblical image. Uh, uh, you, you, you need to make sure you're here next week to hear the good news that uh, Sister Brenda has to bring. But if I can do my work for the next 30 or 40 minutes, uh, what I would like to do is prepare us to hear the message that she has to bring. And our theme, as it's been set by uh, all of the good folks who got together to organize this, our theme is from the second chapter of the letter to the Ephesians. And in the 14th verse of the second chapter, we find that it says that Christ himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier. If you know the letter to the Ephesians, you know that by the time you get to the middle of the second chapter, Ephesians has picked up speed. In the original Greek, the whole uh, first chapter of Ephesians is one run-on sentence that gives you the sense that whoever is writing this thing is writing it breathlessly, talking about the incredible plan God has had since the foundation of the world to save us and to bring us into uh, uh, God's beautiful vision of beloved community. It comes into the second chapter and focuses that on Christ who is our peace. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, and he's done it by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and, regula and regulations. His purpose, we learn, was to create him in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile us to God. I grew up in the church and grew up believing, as I think many of us do, that the most important thing that can happen in an individual's life is to be saved. And that once we are saved, there is a process of discipleship. There is a lifelong journey of growth. Uh, we, we discipline ourselves to prayer and to reading scripture and to a common life in community in the church in order to grow in faith. But we often think about salvation as that individual decision that a person makes and a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Uh, part of the reason I'm glad we've chosen Ephesians to reflect on in this month together is that Ephesians is actually the letter that challenged me to expand my understanding of what salvation means. Because the great cosmic salvation that gets the writer of this letter so excited that he can't pause to take a breath or put a period on a sentence into the second chapter, that gospel that is good news for the whole universe has a particular way that Ephesians says it has been played out. That is that God has in Jesus 
destroyed the divisions that are the result of our rebellion and sin as human beings. God has destroyed that rebellion in Christ. And by making peace in that one new humanity has made it possible for each of us to be reconciled to God. Do you see what Ephesians is saying? That in many ways, my simple reading of the gospel, my very individualistic reading of the gospel is turned on its head. That as a matter of fact, it's not that I get saved and you get saved and someone else gets saved when they make a personal decision and then we figure out what reconciliation and life in God's mission means. No. No, Ephesians says, as a matter of fact, God has brought us together in the new humanity of Christ so that we can be saved. In fact, salvation is how God plans to heal the brokenness, redeem us from the divisions, and reconcile us in Christ. Well, for me, that was a real revelation the first time that came home to me. And I had to begin as a young person to grapple with how I had so misunderstood what God has always been about in the world. I mean, I was raised on the Bible. I knew the scriptures. I had been in church and listened to the sermons, but I had gotten that piece entirely backwards. And so as a young person, I began to reflect on what it was that had made my understanding of Christianity so individualistic. I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church here in North Carolina, and I began, as I looked more closely at the gospel and at how I had understood it and how my community had come to understand it, I, I came to understand that the Southern Baptist Church that I was born in was part of a long history in this country of churches predominantly white churches, churches uh, led by people who understood themselves to be white, that had compromised themselves to white supremacy. Now, this is not, in a sense, saying anything unique about the church. Every institution in the history of the United States compromised itself to white supremacy uh, very early on. Uh, it's part of our nation's history that we have to be honest about. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, every person and every institution is irredeemable, but it does mean that we have inherited a history and we have inherited institutions that were shaped around a fundamental injustice. And part of what I learned as a young person about uh, my own tradition was that uh, here in the South, there had been a, uh, a long reckoning, a long trying to make sense of how people could be Christian in a society where some people claim to own other people based on the color of their skin. That went uh, all the way back to the establishment of the Virginia colony and North Carolina as a colony. And it was written early on, even in the colonial period, into the laws of the land that white people, people whose skin was lighter, uh, people who were called white in many ways for the first time here in this land, were called white to distinguish them from black people, black people who could be uh, owned as property under the law of the land. The first thing that I want to talk about tonight in terms of what that did to the church and the church's vision of mission here in the American story is to say that the American church did not simply compromise with an evil. Uh, that is something that human beings often do. Uh, but I think it's important for us to understand 
that the church in the United States didn't simply give in and go along with this evil, but rather that Christianity became a sort of host for the parasite of white supremacy. This is language that I learned from uh, Professor Willie Jennings at Yale University. He was the academic dean at the seminary where I studied. And it was very helpful for me to begin to understand from him the unique role that Christianity played in creating a world where white people could imagine themselves as superior to their African-American sisters and brothers. To help you see it, I, uh, if you were here, I would take you just a few miles down the road here to uh, one of the plantations in North Carolina that was preserved. Now to root this in the logic of the plantation is not to make it a particularly Southern reality because great scholars like Ibram Kendi, uh, whose National Book Award winning book, Stamped from the Beginning, traces slaveholder religion all the way back to Cotton Mather in Massachusetts. Uh, it's not a particularly Southern reality, and yet you can see it, and you can see how it played itself out and played itself out over generations on the plantation. Um, if I took you to this local plantation, I could also take you to the Episcopal Church down the road, the Episcopal Church where the family that started that plantation was members for generations from the 18th century on. And in the Episcopal Church, which was the society church of that time, the, the church where anybody who was respectable went, the members of this church were the people who established the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill down the road in the other direction. It's the oldest public university in this country. Um, they were, uh, in many ways, for generations, the people who uh, ran this state and developed its form of government. And they were, by and large, slave owners, uh, people who understood themselves to be faithful Christians and who owned other human beings under the law of the land. One of the members of that church in the 19th century was Thomas Ruffin, who sat on the Supreme Court in North Carolina and wrote the decision in a famous case uh, called State versus Man, in which uh, Mr. Man had been accused of murder for killing a man that he owned under the law as his slave. And uh, the issue in the court was whether someone could be convicted of killing their property, that is the person that they enslaved. In Ruffin's decision, he acknowledged as a Christian, that he trembled to think uh, about the implications of what this meant, uh, given that um, uh, all people are created in God's image. And nevertheless, he wrote uh, in these famous words that in order for the submission of the slave to be absolute, the authority of the master must be complete. It was a, a justification of even murder, even the killing of another human being, because the law said that one person could be the property of another person. He was a member of that church, as were the uh, owners of this plantation up the road that's now called Stagville. And if you go out there today, uh, you can go to a little chapel that was built on the uh, grounds there, uh, close to the big house. And there was a negotiation that the priest from St. Matthew's Episcopal Church, this parish uh, that where, where the family there were members, there was a negotiation that the priest would go out from uh, the parish to stay at the big house there uh, one weekend out of the month, and uh, a sizable donation was made uh, to pay for the building of the chapel and for uh, the priest's time to evangelize the slaves. In, uh, this, in the 18th century, this became incredibly important to the uh, identity of the Episcopal Church in North Carolina, that slave evangelization was a moral responsibility. 
that is, white supremacy, as it was established and written into law in this country, was not seen as a sort of hatred. It was not seen as a, uh, 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 an enmity toward uh, the people who were enslaved. Rather, it was seen as a Christian responsibility to guarantee that the souls of those people who were enslaved on those plantations would learn the gospel. Not a gospel that in any way challenged their status as slaves, not a gospel that in any way suggested that the injustice of their bondage should be challenged. No, that wasn't what the priest was called to teach. The priest was called to teach that their personal relationship with God and their choice, their individual choice to have salvation was an important part of what it meant for them to be uh, um, part of the life of that plantation. And so I think that's one example that begins to show us how the mission of the church in a context where white supremacy was the law of the land and was the accepted practice of the government, the, the practice of the church and the church's mission even became shaped by this white supremacy that was parasitic on the life of the church. That is, the life of the church perpetuated the white supremacy. It gave people reason to feel good about what they were doing over and against their African-American sisters and brothers who remained in bondage. The second thing that I think is important for us to understand in terms of missions is that in the 19th century, there was a very strong and often faith-based challenge to race-based chattel slavery. It was called the abolition movement right here in North Carolina. A Quaker named Levi Coffin, who grew up outside of Greensboro, uh, saw uh, people being brought back from the north on the, on the road that came down from Pennsylvania through Greensboro, the main thoroughfare, the highway of that day. He saw uh, enslaved people in chains who had run away being brought back and returned to the plantations that they had escaped from. And even as a boy in Greensboro, he heard the cries of those people and he understood that God wanted him to work for the abolition of slavery. He became known later when he moved to Indiana as the uh, conductor of the Underground Railroad. His farm in Indiana was one of the stops and he uh, uh, communicated with a wide network of black and white Christians and non-Christians who worked together to subvert this system that they knew was ungodly and unrighteous. That was a moral movement that challenged the system of slavery in the 19th century. And yet, those who uh, argued for uh, its continuance uh, in perpetuity, those who wanted uh, uh, African Americans to be uh, in bondage and who wanted to uh, argue for white supremacy also used the scriptures. And they used the Bible to argue for the enslavement of black people as a good. There's a Baptist preacher named Thornton Stringfellow who wrote uh, one of the arguments that was uh, particularly important for me to come to understand as I grappled with this as a Baptist. He wrote this argument over and against the abolitionists in the middle of the 19th century. And what he said, uh, as he developed his argument, was that not only was the practice of slavery practical, not only was it good for society, and not only was it justifiable, given that there had been enslavement in other eras of history, he pointed to scriptures uh, in the Old and the New Testament in which it, it was slavery was assumed. Not, not only are all of those arguments, uh, arguments on behalf of slavery continuing, but he said, it must be said that slavery is a good, and it is a good not only to white people, but also to the enslaved. The argument that he made over and against the abolitionists to justify the continuation of slavery was an argument based in missions. <laughs> 
He said that if the enslaved Africans in this country had remained in, as he said, pagan Africa, they would have died and gone to hell. Now, this is a man who understood the scriptures. He had read the Bible, but he was blind to the basic fact that right there in Acts, Philip had met the Ethiopian on the road. He had received the gospel, taken it home. The church had been in Africa long before it ever came to America. But as he understood Christianity and this white supremacy that had been parasitic on it at that point for generations, he argued that it was a good that those enslaved people had been brought here so that they could hear the gospel from their Christian enslavers. And he waxed eloquent about how one day, because of this good of slavery in the United States, those people might go back to pagan Africa and proclaim the good news of the gospel there. I think most of us, when we hear that kind of argument today, can hear how wicked it is, can hear how twisted the logic is, how, how, how misunderstood the Bible is to justify something like that. But we don't often think about how much our understanding of what the gospel is and what it means to evangelize was shaped by generations of that way of reading the scriptures. It is no accident that the largest Christian mission organization in the world is the International Mission Board that was started by the Southern Baptist Church, in which Thornton Stringfellow was ordained as a minister in the mid-19th century. Because people who came to understand that an individual's personal decision to accept Jesus into their heart was what the gospel meant, and that the most important thing you could do to share that gospel with others would be to proclaim it to as many people as possible and ask them to make a personal decision along the same lines. That shaped the gospel. And it has shaped not only the Southern Baptist tradition, but American Christianity and so much of how we understand evangelization down to this day. And so the third thing that I want to say this evening is that this slaveholder religion that we have inherited has, in so many ways, shaped everything. And there is no... Uh, um, church of slaveholder religion over here that you can leave in order to join the pure and peaceable uh, church over here. No, what I have learned over the years is that we're talking about something that runs throughout American Christianity. It runs throughout our denominational life. It runs through our missions agencies and it runs through us as individuals. I am an heir of the gospel of Jesus that was preached as good news to transform the world in the first century. And I believe that that gospel has power to transform absolutely everything. But I am also the heir of a slaveholder religion that took the texts and the language of that message and used them in order to perpetuate white supremacy in this society. And so we all face the challenge of how we can learn to be anti-racist in a tradition and in a society that has practiced and perpetuated racism in so many ways, and in particular, how the church can do that as an instrument through which white supremacy has been propagated and justified for centuries. And the good news, I believe, the good news is that there has always been an anti-racist gospel in this country. That those abolitionists who I was talking about earlier practiced a faith that told them not only that slavery was not God's will, but that they had a moral obligation to interrupt it, to establish an underground railroad, to argue in the public square against this moral evil that they knew they had to oppose. 
that tradition has continued. After the Civil War, during Reconstruction, slaveholder religion made an incredible stand, particularly in the South, and historians name the period after which Reconstruction was, was crushed in the South, they name it with a theological term. They call it the redemption movement because so many of the white supremacists who reestablished white supremacy through Jim Crow laws in the late 19th and early 20th century, so many of them were Christian preachers, preachers of the lost cause religion, who lifted up the, uh, uh, as they said, the, uh, the moral, the immorality of uh, black and white people being together, what they called miscegenation. They railed against that immorality and talked about how we needed to get back to the true values that God had given to people in the Southern way of life. That was the reaction, and yet there were people, Christians, white and black, who formed fusion coalitions that resisted that, that argued against redemption even as it was happening, and when those people took control of the governments in the South, continued to, to, to build a witness through interracial labor organizing, through small experiments where, as many of you know, people risked their very lives to be together across racial lines. This continued all up into the civil rights movement. It's what made the civil rights movement possible, that there were people of faith who, because of their conviction about God's love for all of us, the inherent dignity of everyone, no matter the color of their skin, came together and said that not only were these Jim Crow laws that created a two-tiered society wrong, but they had to be resisted. And after those signs came down, uh, those folks understood that that was not enough. They formed a poor people's campaign in the late 1960s to challenge an economic system that had been built on an inequality that assumed that some people uh, had to do the labor of other people because of the color of their skin. And that work has continued up until today. There, are, there is a witness. It's a witness that uh, hasn't gotten nearly the attention that I think it needs and deserves, and a witness that we don't often think about when we think about Christian missions. But it's something that I want to point to because it's been such a gift to me. It has, in the face of the hypocrisy and the moral contradictions of the slaveholder religion that I have to confess and acknowledge that is in me, it has given me hope that I can continue to follow Jesus and that Jesus's gospel is good news for this world because it has been lived out in a way that builds beloved community and that is for the healing of the nations. So let me just lift up three things that I think the anti-racist gospel teaches us, in particular about missions. The first thing is that there's no separation between a personal relationship with Jesus and Jesus's work for justice in this world. That bifurcation of our relationship with Jesus from our work for justice is rooted in the lies of slaveholder religion. And when we proclaim the gospel, the anti-racist gospel that is good news for all people, we have to know that whatever your tradition, whether it's about you know, accepting Jesus as your savior or walking the aisle as I did at the Baptist church when I was a young person, whether it's about uh, 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 being catechized or, uh, or going through a, 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 a process of discipleship so that you're baptized into the church, whether it's about being born again or slain in the spirit or uh, water and spirit baptized, whatever your tradition, there is no way to come into a real and personal relationship with Jesus without joining Jesus's work for justice in this world. And the second thing I've learned from an anti-racist gospel in our history and in the present 
is that sharing that gospel can never be about giving out of our bounty and overflow to others uh, as a kind of charity. No, sharing that gospel has to always be about joining God where God is already at work, usually among the poor and rejected and overlooked people in any community. I think that's right at the heart of scripture. It's why so many people are so confused by Jesus's ministry. Why does he hang out with the tax collectors and the sinners? Why is Jesus always with this riffraff? If he's supposed to be a religious leader, why doesn't he have his religious credentials? Why doesn't he do his work in the temple? Why is he leading this uh, people's march into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? The reason Jesus is challenged by so many of the religious leaders in his own day is because Jesus sees what God is doing out in the world among people who have been rejected by the religious authorities and by the political and economic systems of their world. And yet, when they hear the good news that God is for them, blessed are the poor, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Jesus stands up in his own hometown and in the first sermon says, the spirit of the Lord is on me, quoting the prophet Isaiah, for he has given me good news to proclaim to the poor. This, this is the heart of missions and what we have to reclaim if we want to be engaged in God's mission in an anti-racist way. The good news that God is already at work in the world and that mission cannot be about us sharing out of our abundance, but it has to be about going out and discovering where God is at work and joining that work and movement among the crowd. And finally, I want to say that an anti-racist gospel teaches us that we are not called to establish franchises for the kingdom, you know, little McDonald's for the gospel all over the world, uh, delivery mechanisms for some product that we have that just has to tweak it and make it uh, appealing in the cultural context where we end up. No, we're not called to establish franchises for the kingdom, but we are called together with our neighbors and all of God's people in any place to cultivate beloved community so that people can see a people together who have no other good reason to be together. I think that's the critical thing for us to understand about Jesus's ministry. Who are the disciples? Jesus calls a group of people who would have never been together in that society if God had not called them together. You got Matthew, the tax collector. He works for the feds. Jesus puts him together in this small group with two zealots. They're on the terrorist watch list. These are not people who would naturally be together. And yet across every dividing line, across the, 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 the dividing walls that we have inherited in any society, Jesus brings people together and cultivates this beloved community, which not only gives life to them, but is life giving to the world around them. When the Holy Spirit falls on Pentecost and the church begins to break out, uh, not only in that one little cell, but all over the Mediterranean world, what do they say at, at Antioch? They say, we don't know what to call these people because we used to call the people that met over there the Jews, but now we, the Gentiles are with the Jews. These people who shouldn't be together are together. So Acts says they called them Christian first at Antioch. Critical to reclaiming Christian mission as an anti-racist work that God is doing in the world is us embracing that strange identity and knowing that we're not called to build franchises. We're called 
to cultivate beloved community in the places where we are and discover what church means with the people who are there. I'll end there and open it up for questions. Again, it's a great honor to be with you and I'm looking forward to this month. Um, I see Hunter coming back. And Casey yes, too. Thank, yes, thank and let you. Let me say a thank you to Michelle, who tried to follow along with my non-standard English for all 40 minutes. Bless your soul. Yes, and thank you for that challenging presentation, Reverend Jonathan. Um, we've already began to receive questions from tonight's participants. Um, if you'd like to send us your question, please do so now using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So just bear with me one moment. And I did see a question in there that seemed like a good one to start out with. Um, okay, so we'll from an anonymous attendee who says, sites. do I understand correctly that you see a relationship between seeing evangelism as an individual faith slash conversion movement and how that can support existing white supremacist attitudes? Can you explain more about this connection and or how a community oriented from or uh, I'm sorry, how a community, community oriented form of mission can be more anti-racist. Thanks again. I yeah, can repeat that if you'd like. I'm so sorry. I, uh, I tried to tell a very long story quickly to illustrate uh, how I understand this very individualistic understanding of the gospel to be rooted in our history of slaveholder religion. But this is a pointed question because it's absolutely about the reality that we're dealing with, which is to say, you know, is that articulation propping up white supremacy today? And I think the answer is yes, to the extent that we preach the gospel in a way that we don't make a necessary connection between your individual relationship with Jesus and Jesus's work for justice in the world. Um, now, I'm not trying to have people have a less personal relationship with Jesus. I, I, I think it's critically important that we have contemplative practices that bring us deeper and deeper into the love of God. And I've spent a lot of my work in ministry uh, 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 helping people access the broad resources of the tradition uh, for th that kind of contemplative practice. A personal relationship with Jesus is incredibly important to me. And um, I, I could, I could uh, talk for another hour about how uh, uh, my own personal relationship with Jesus has been deepened by the songs that grew out of the hush arbors where enslaved people learned to worship Jesus in a different way than they were trying to teach them to worship Jesus in that uh, plantation chapel. Because they took the Bible that they learned there, they took the Jesus that they met there, they took him back into the hush arbor and they said, hush. Hush, somebody's calling my name. Oh, hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Ooh. I think it's a whole contemplative tradition in those songs, and they matter a great deal to me. However, you know, one of the songs that's at the heart of that tradition is the song that says, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord till I die. And the second verse says, I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield till I die. So even within the spirituality of that very personal relationship with Jesus is the notion that you can't know Jesus without being engaged in a struggle with this world and this world's broken system. So that's the thing that I think we have to uh, recover in particular in our evangelism, that there is no way to preach Jesus just by, you know, calling for people to accept Jesus as their savior and maybe planning a church, which is much of what Christian missions often looks like. If, if, if we call people to a personal relationship with Jesus and we plan a church, uh, both of which are good things to do, then, then there has to be an intentional way in which we also discover along with people and invest ourselves 
in the work to bring justice in those communities. And uh, that's what I've learned from that long tradition that stretches, you know, from the edges of the plantations through uh, the, the very first, we, call, we often call them black churches in America, but uh, you go back 1865 when all these, you know, institutions were established, particularly in the South where, you know, black folks couldn't gather before the end of uh, the Civil War in public. All these churches that were established in 1865, you go back and read their charters. Their charters don't say we are establishing a black church. They say we are establishing a, a church for all people because we are aware, obviously, that there are churches in which we're not welcome. At least we're not welcome as full members. And so that tradition, I think, is one that has always held a personal relationship with Jesus right together with the necessary work for justice in the world which is always political. And so we have to consider what the politics of Jesus means alongside and with the poor and rejected of our society wherever we live. And that's, um, I think that's a critical piece of Christian missions. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Reverend Jonathan. Uh, I've got a question here from one of our uh, viewers who's asking the question, um, uh, what, what, what reaction do you get from people when you introduce the term slaveholder religion? And how do you respond to them? I think they're anticipating you get some, some negative response in that use of that term. Yeah, um, well, uh, first, the first thing I always try to do is confess that I am an inheritor and a practitioner <laughs> of slaveholder religion, and as well, I hope, uh, of the Christianity of Christ. This is a term, I, I don't think I said this tonight, but if you're, you're not aware, it's, it's not something I made up. It's a term I borrowed from Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass said in his first autobiography that between the Christianity of the slaveholder and the Christianity of Christ, he saw the widest possible difference. And in making that distinction, of course, he was identifying himself as a Christian, but also challenging the Christianity of the people who had claimed to own him. And... Uh, uh, I, I think the reactions are twofold. One is that sometimes people hear it as a sort of attack, as if it's an attack on them personally or on their community. And I don't mean to say that, uh, except to say that, you know, uh, as Christians, we confess um, original sin and we confess sin that is uh, in all of us and in all of society. So to that extent, I think as Christians, uh, we have to be about the work of um, naming sin and repenting of it. Uh, Carl Bart taught us that, you know, you only ever know sin on the way out. So if you're naming it, you're beginning to see it, which means you're beginning to leave it behind. And so, uh, so, 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 so there's that reaction. But then I think the other reaction that I often get, and in some ways I think it might not be the most helpful term, to address this issue, which is that sometimes people say, well, you know, that really is an important uh, issue to talk about in the 17th century or 18th century or 19th century. You know, slaveholder religion get, can feel like something that happened uh, uh, and, and, and that ended maybe, to, you know, uh, at the end of the Civil War. And so uh, I think it's critically important to understand that that religion is connected to a system that has continued and perpetuated itself. My dear brother down at the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson, he often says, slavery never ended. It just uh, 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 rearranged itself, right? Uh, the, the white supremacy uh, didn't, didn't go away. Uh, it just morphed. It, it became the redemption movement. It became the Jim Crow. It became uh, uh, um, a, a war on drugs and mass incarceration and what Michelle Alexander calls a new Jim Crow. It became a system today in which, uh, um, as a colleague over here at Duke often says, uh, we can have racism without racists, right? Because all of the systems are set up to assume white values as the uh, uh, highest achievement and uh, and therefore uh, to create inequalities across all of our systems. There's no denying that if you look at the data, right? We have disparate outcomes in education, in health, in wealth, in 
uh, incarceration, uh, and uh, let's, let's look at COVID. You know, if you're black in America, you're three times as likely to catch COVID and, and you're five times as likely to die from it. That's no accident, right? That's not because this virus somehow acts differently in black bodies. No, that's because of systems that treat people differently. And that's, that's what people mean when they talk about systemic racism or institutional racism. Uh, I just call it racism or white supremacy because there's no other reason for which racism ever existed. Uh, this is what Brother Ibram Kendi, I think, teaches so well at his anti-racist institute today. He is constantly helping us see ever more clearly, and, 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 and I love to see him every time he's on CBS explaining it, you know, on Good Morning or whatever their morning show is. He's explaining to people that racism is not fundamentally how you feel about your neighbor. It's not whether you say the N-word. Those are the, you know, those are the collateral consequences, the ideas that were developed to justify this system. The, the, the racism is the system that was created to exploit people and their labor. And once you do that, you then have to come up with all kinds of lies that explain why it's justifiable. But racism is a system. And so uh, I think that's the reality that we're dealing with. And I think uh, in particular for Christians in America, we have a great responsibility, a great responsibility for the way this lie has been parasitic on our faith and the way it has been perpetuated in the language of our faith and in the institutions of our faith such that um, you could fairly say, I believe, that white supremacy could not continue in the United States of America if every white Christian became anti-racist, if every white Christian institution became anti-racist. White supremacy could not continue. It would not be politically viable if it weren't for the support of so many white Christians. So I think that's the, that's the reality we face. And it has everything to do with our mission in this world. To use your image again, Reverend Jonathan, you'd say that the virus can't survive without its host. Mm -hmm. So white supremacy couldn't survive without that, that institutional uh, embodiment that the church has provided for it for all these centuries. Yes, indeed. Wow. Yes, indeed. Casey, do you have another question there, Handy? I've got only 40 left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we got lots think, of questions. I saw one that- I think we got like, a month, huh? <laughs> it looks like this would be a good one to end on because I think we only have time for one more. Let me quickly go ahead and try and find that. Okay. Um, so a participant asked, how do you go about challenging, I think that challenging, encouraging, and empowering present-day evangelical pastors to preach more about biblical justice from the pulpit. I believe in our current situ in our current season, this is a must. Oh, your microphone went off there. Oh, that was the end. Yeah, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, absolutely. So let me just speak directly to um, one of the challenges that we face, and I think it's what the questioner is suggesting. Uh, after all, uh, when we're done here, there's a vice presidential debate. Everybody's aware of the fact that we're right in the middle of an election. Uh, we are often in the church told that um, we can't speak to issues of justice because those issues are political. And um, I think that that um, is a part of the bifurcation of the gospel from justice in our public life uh, has been the widespread acceptance of a, uh, of a Christianity that is not political. It would be very difficult. I mean, you could try it sometime when you have um, a day or two to read through all four gospels. It would be very difficult to 
read the ministry of Jesus uh, in the first century and not say that what Jesus was inviting people into and what he was proposing was political. Uh, he started a popular movement. They mimicked the emperor's triumphal entry into Jerusalem when they marched in on Palm Sunday. And obviously the uh, local authorities, both political and religious, understood that because they crucified him which is not what you do with somebody who you, you know, disagree with their um, religious ideas. It's what you do for political subversives. And so if we acknowledge that Jesus's ministry is political, I think it's uh, only natural to assume that uh, those of us who follow Jesus, if we're gonna work for justice, must also engage in political life. I, I don't know exactly the te technology of how this is working, but uh, I recorded a workshop for this conference that's about uh, a book that I've published this year on this. It's called Revolution of Values, and it's all about how we reclaim faith for the common good. So I would encourage you to watch that, however that, that works within this month, and to uh, reflect on this more deeply. But, but the thing I would say in response to this question is that my, you know, my conclusion from all that reflection is that it is very important for the church to carve out a space where we can consider political issues in a way that is not strictly partisan. I completely agree with that. And uh, I don't want to have Democrat churches and Republican churches in the United States. Just like I, you know, in other countries, I don't want to have you know, churches that are aligned with other political parties. I think it's critically important that we are part of a body of believers that includes Democrats and independents and Republicans. Uh, however, there are distortions and lies in our public life uh, that have perpetuated injustice through the parties and the systems that exist. And wherever those things uh, uh, are identifiable, we have a moral obligation to challenge them. And so uh, I think that is uh, the critically important work of the church, to push forward a moral vision for how we can share life together, and in particular, how our life together can be attentive to the needs of the most vulnerable. That's at the heart of the gospel. It's, uh, I, I just on Sunday read this new encyclical from Pope Francis, and I think it's right at the heart of what he's saying. He's saying uh, to you know, a billion Catholics around the world, um, look, you know, there are different political systems, there are different ideas about how we address this thing, but we've got to acknowledge that we have a global economic system that has left half of the population or more in some places uh, in, in destitution. And as Christians, we have to be concerned in love about a system that crushes uh, uh, so many people. So, so in that sense, I think we, we must be political, uh, although we've got to you know, leave space and room to recognize that we are a body made up of people of different parties, different political ideologies, you know, different, different ways of coming at the issues. Beautiful. Reverend Jonathan, uh, you've gotten us started. Uh, I see about uh, 40 more questions that have come to us. Um, people are hungry to, to think about this. Thank you for starting with scripture. Thank you for leading us back through a review of our own history, a history that we see that reflection in our own churches, in our own lives, even today. That's, that, that's really powerful. Thank you for that. Um, I'm thankful we've had uh, about 500 people with us uh, this evening for this first uh, evening. Uh, we'll be gathering together at the same time next week um, uh, for Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil who will be leading us Don't in a reflection. That. Don't miss that. Right? Uh, a Long Journey to Reconciliation is the title of her uh, presentation. Michelle, we've gotten so many shout outs to you as our ASL interpreter. We just want to say a word of thank you. Uh, thanks for your uh, participation tonight. People have appreciated it. And Reverend Jonathan, the, the, the deep appreciation is being expressed by so many people in, the, in our Q&A uh, um, uh, chat here. Um, I do want to say to all of the folks who participated tonight, um, we're doing what you're not supposed to do. Uh, we're, we're stepping over thin ice. We're looking at 
uh, one of the most volatile issues in U.S. society, particularly in our churches. So I want to say a word of thanks to everyone, to God's Spirit, and to all of you who've had the courage to gather together tonight in a spirit of openness and, and vulnerability to think about these issues with us. Before we dismiss you, many of you will be gathering uh, for a local uh, virtual watch party with your church or your Bible study, your campus ministry, using the link that your convener sent you uh, before tonight. Um, I'd like to invite you to pray with me as we close our time tonight. Pray with me then. God of grace and God of justice, we give you thanks tonight for wisdom shared, for assumptions challenged, for commitments made. Go with us into our local groups that we can together reflect on what we've learned and commit to accompanying your spirit in your mission of justice and righteousness and peace. Amen. Our thanks again to Reverend Jonathan, and on behalf of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, good night, God bless, and we'll see you next Wednesday at the same time with Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter-McNeil. God bless. Thanks now.